Hello class, it's time to start our lecture on chapter 15, which includes disorders of white blood cells and lymphoid tissues. Um, to be very honest, there isn't a lot sexy with this, um, so I'm just going to go through and describe a few of the white blood cell disorders. Really not too taxingly difficult, and unlike the anemias, I think those are a little bit more challenging than the lymphomas and leukemias. All right, so first, just to remind you, we've seen this picture before, but in a different type, and I just looked online on your wiki boards, and I saw that a student has posted several very nice pictures of how white blood cells differentiate, as well as the red blood cells, etc. So just to remind you, we have a a progenitor stem cell called a hemocytoblast. When it replicates and divides, it gives birth to two daughter colony forming units, the myeloid stem cell line or the lymphoid stem cell line. And the lymphoid stem cell line is going to generate your lymphocytes, your T cells and B cells. The myeloid stem cell line, of course, is going to generate all the rest of the formed elements, the granular leukocytes, neutrophils, basophils, eosinophils the monocytes, and also platelets, of course. There are about six to 9,000 white blood cells per microliter of blood, but this is very misleading. You have very many, many more uh, white blood cells actually in your connective tissue and lymphoid tissue, etc. So that's just the number in the blood itself. Obviously, to get a cell to differentiate into its specific cell type, it needs growth factors like insulin, leukin-1, and differentiation factors, etc. So just a little bit to remind you of T cells and B cells, and, and just a quick overview. Uh, bone marrow-derived precursors enter, well, let me back up. First of all, we have the T cells and B cells, and they're going to develop as a lymphoblast, a pro-lymphocyte. Now, depending on which cell we're talking about, um, the B cell is going to continue to, quote, mature further in the bone marrow. The T cell will leave the bone marrow and then mature in the thymus. And then they both need to uh, basically further mature in the lymphoid tissue. So like I said, T cells, they're going to mature in the thymus, and they're going to turn into T cells like CD4 and CD8 cells. CD4 cells um, and CD8 cells have different names. CD4 cells are also known as helper T cells, and CD8 cells are known as cytotoxic T cells. I always remember like this. If you were to make the letter, the letter, good grief, the number four, and turn it around, do a, um, a 180 turn of the number four, you would get the letter H. So that's how I remember four really means H, helper T cell. And CD8, well, those are the cells that ate the other cells. Pretty good, huh? That's why they give me the money to teach you all these things. Anyway. There are, of course, other T cells that are involved in regulating other immune cells. The B cell, of course, is going to, uh, once it matures a little bit more in the bone marrow, it's going to leave the bone marrow as a B cell and expresses IgM. I remember that as the mega. It's the early immunoglobulin that's expressed. And it has more than two um, sites to bind to antigens. It's got like 10 of them, so I think M for mega. But when an antigen-presenting cell presents an antigen to a B cell, that will induce it to mature into a plasma cell, and it will then create your antigen-specific IgGs, or immunoglobulins. So just to continue on a little bit here, um, bone marrow-derived precursors enter the thymus. This is the T cell development. And they're going to undergo intrathymic development that includes sequential stages of maturation. Um, double negative stage means that the T cell does not express the CD4 nor the CD8 receptor. And then this is going to be followed up with a double positive. And then ultimately, they're going to differentiate into either having one 
or the other receptor, either the CD8 or the CD4 receptor. And again, the CD4 will be the helper T cells. They're the ones that, can, that are actually the link between the two immune systems. The helper T cells can provoke the CD8 cells, but helper T cells can also provoke the B cells. So it really is the link between your humoral immune system, which is your B cells, and your cell to cell or cell mediated immune system, which is your T cells. The CD8 cells are going to be fantastic at in, um, inducing apoptosis in the cells that are infected with, our, our body cells that are infected with viruses or bacteria or even fungi. So really interesting stuff. Um, and how the thymus actually selects for T cells is another amazing story. And I just want to take a little time to explain it to you. And this is really watered down, but the genetics are amazing. Okay, so here's my analogy. There was a TV show not too long ago called Who's the Boss? And Tony Danza was in it, and um, he had a daughter, Sam, Samantha, and she got old enough where she was able to start dating. Now, the date, her date comes over to pick her up, and Tony Danza, the father, he answers the door and he sends Sam away. He wants to talk to the boy first for a moment. And he sits the boy down and he basically traps him. He entraps him. So he sits him down, chats him up for a little bit, and then he says, hey, do you want to have a beer with me? Now this kid was underage. And the kid says, sure, that sounds great. Next thing you know, Tony Danza picks this kid up by the scruff of his neck and throws him out and tells Sam she's not going anywhere. So how is that story applicable to the thymus? Okay, so T cell maturation occurs early, early on in life before you've been exposed to any virus or bacteria potentially. I mean, it's, it starts at a very young age. Um, by the time your age five or seven, your thymus should be done with this, and it actually involutes. Okay, so what, how does a thymus know to leave alone any T cell that can fight a foreign antigen, something that's not you, but then destroy anything, any T cell that would attack your cells? Well, here's how it works. Clearly, at a young age, you have not been exposed to antigens. It's not like you have a library of antigens that your thymus can take down off the shelf, wave it in front of a T cell, and see which one attacks it. So instead, and this is very clever, it goes Tony Danza on us. It basically waves, waves, presents in front of the immature T cell a self antigen. And if the T cell goes for it, then the thymus knows to destroy it because it's a self-fighting T cell. Genius, right? It's like the thymus saying, hey, you want a beer? And if the T cell goes for it, it's out of there. So instead of a beer, of course, it's, hey, do you want a piece of this cell? This is a piece of us. And if the T cell goes for it, then clearly this should not be kept around because that can lead to an autoimmune disorder. And again, that was really watered down, but I thought that's kind of fun and cool to at least hear about on a superficial level. All right, so differential white blood cell counts. Um, when a person is suspected of having a white blood cell disorder, blood can be obtained from the patient and a blood smear prepared. From this, a differential white blood cell count can be done. Basically, all the white blood cells are counted and a tally of how many of each type of white blood cell found is kept. So they're, they're basically looking for their traditional values. 60, 30, 6, 3, 1, right? Neutrophils, lymphocytes, monocytes, eosinophils, basophils. You get the idea. Never let monkeys eat bananas. All right, so non-neoplastic disorders include leukopenia and proliferating disorders. I'm just going to briefly describe these. Leukopenia describes an absolute decrease in white blood cell numbers. The disorder may affect any of the specific types of white blood cells, but most often it affects neutrophils, which, as we know, under normal healthy conditions is the most abundant granulocyte. So a lack of neutrophils is called neutropenia, 
and it could be congenital or acquired. For the acquired, a number of conditions, including aplastic anemia and treatment with chemotherapeutic drugs and irradiation, can cause leukopenia. There are also idiosyncratic drug reactions that can lead to leukopenia. Idiosyncratic is a term used to describe drug reactions that are different from the effects obtained in most per persons and that cannot be explained in terms of allergies. In other words, a patient reacts very badly to a particular drug with no known reason why. Although I'm sure you're hearing me say gene expression right about now. A number of drugs can cause idiosyncratic reactions like chloramphenicol, which is used as an antibiotic, and a few antipsychotic drugs like clozapine and chloropro chloropromazine. Those are uh, uh, basically types of diazepam. Uh, I'm losing my voice again. Diazepams. All right. Um, obviously, if a person has reduced white blood cells, then they would be more prone to infection. Now, what is infectious mononucleosis? Well, it's caused by the Epstein-Barr virus, which is a part of the herpes virus family. Um, mononucleosis, it's basically going to be an infection of B cells, and they become blastocyst-like. They get very, very large. Um, so they are, their nucleus is extremely large. Now there are two, way, two ways that the virus can actually infect the B cells. And I'm showing this up here in the top right picture, but your book also describes. And basically, um, these two forms are it can kill the infected B cell, or the virus itself can incorporate itself into the cell's genome. The B cells that harbor the EBV genome proliferate in the circulation, and they're going to produce heterophil antibodies. And the detection of these heterophil antibodies helps in the diagnosis of infectious mononucleosis. So a heterophil antibodies, um, these are IgGs that react to antigens of other, sh of other species, specifically sheep red blood cells. And so they simply use a simple test to identify if there are these heterophil antibodies, and then that confirms the diagnosis of infectious mononucleosis. So most typically, a person who's infected, many of us get infected with um, the EBV virus, but are typically um, asymptomatic, you know, maybe a little fever, a little runny nose, but nothing big. Um, those that where the virus actually infects the B cell and incorporates its DNA, they can have more of an acute response. This acute response can last two to three weeks. But and then, again, they present with fever. They, um, they have a sore throat. And usually the treatment we give them is supportive. We just give them the, tell them to rest, give them the analgesics like aspirin to relieve the headache, etc. cetera. Um, but their lethargy can last for a long, long time. So this person will still have the EBV, the Epstein-Barr virus in them. They remain, quote, infected, but asymptomatic for life and they can shed this EBV in their saliva from the B cells that are residing in the oropharyngeal region, like in the lymph nodes there. And this can then in turn infect other people. Now what about neoplasmic disorders, the malignant lymphomas? I'm going to start first with non-Hodgkin's lymphomas. Now neoplasmic, we know this means new growth. Malignant lymphoma, this is going to be a solid tumor in lymph nodes. And it could be a tumor of either the B cells or the T cells. And if you're reading your textbook in a lymph node, T cells and B cells typically reside in a lymph node in different places. So the B cells tend to be in the outer cortex region in areas known as a primary follicle and then a secondary follicle, which means they're being stimulated, they're being presented with their antigen and they're maturing. The T cells tend to be in the next layer of the cortex, the deeper layer, closer to the medulla. So either of these can uh, 
be a part of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Now, just a quick review, just in case it's been a while since you've had a micro class. Um, normal B cells and T cells do different jobs within the immune system. B lymphocytes, the B cells normally help protect the body against germs like bacteria or viruses by making proteins, of course, called antibodies. And the antibodies attach to these microbes, specific parts of them, and mark them for destruction by other immune system cells like the uh, neutrophils or macrophages. So the antibodies produced stick all around the microbe and this allows better phagocytizing that's not a word. This allows the phagocyting, this allows white blood cells like macrophages and neutrophils to phagocytize those microbes easier in a process known as opsonization. All right, T lymphocytes. Like I said before, there are several types of T cells, each one with a special job. Some T cells can directly destroy cells infected with viruses fungi or certain kinds of bacteria. These would be the CD8 cells, the cytotoxic T cells, the ones that induce apoptosis in the infected cell. T cells can also release substances that attract other types of white blood cells, which then digest the infected cells. That would be your, your CD4 cells, your helper T cells. I like to think of them as the Paul Revere of the white blood cells. They go around shouting, if you will, saying, hey, look what's over here. Come here. Come get it. Here's the, you know, here are the red coats. Let's go get them. And then some types of T cells play a role in either boosting or slowing the activity of other immune system cells. So those are your suppressor T cells, and we're still learning a lot about them. Both types of lymphocytes can develop into lymphomas, but B cell lymphomas are much more common in the United States than T cell. Different types of lymphoma can develop from each type of lymphocyte based on how mature they are and when they become cancerous and other factors. And your textbook goes into that, but I'm not. I just find that very tedious. So I prefer to do just a general overview. Um, if you feel like you're being shortchanged, I'm sorry. Um, just start reading your textbook and you'll get really annoyed, in my opinion, with all the abbreviations that you have to keep straight, like ALL, CLL, NHL, etc. So treatment for each lymphoma depends on, of course, which type it is. So determining the exact type of lymphoma is important. There are two main types of lymphomas. There's Hodgkin's lymphoma, also known as Hodgkin's disease, or Hodgkin disease. Anyway, it was named after Dr. Thomas Hodgkin, who first described it. And then there's non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Now, which one would you prefer to have if you had to have one? You would prefer to have the Hodgkin's lymphoma. It has a much higher cure rate, cure rate, not just remission, cure rate. Non-Hodgkin's lymphoma simply has a remission rate. So I'd much rather have Hodgkin's lymphoma. The two present with very similar signs and symptoms in a patient. They're both going to have you know, night sweats, unexplained fever, mostly happens at night, extreme weight loss, etc. The two types of lymphomas behave, spread, and respond to treatment very differently. B cell lymphomas tend to proliferate in B cell areas of the lymph node, like I said, out in the outer cortex layer. And T cell lymphomas tend to be in that middle layer, in between the outer cortex and the medullary area. So once a lymph node has been, uh, is swollen, now your lymph nodes, of course, I'm sure you know this, they can become swollen because you're naturally fighting an infection. You should not naturally you know, have your knee-jerk reaction just because you feel swollen nodes in your neck or your armpit that you have a, a lymphoma. That's not the case usually. Um, but if you have swollen lymph nodes that last for a while and you are experiencing the night sweats and you are experiencing um, the weight loss, well then yeah, you should go see your doctor. And they're basically going to do a biopsy to find out if they detect any type of cancerous cells in there. 
Um, Epstein-Barr virus infection is associated with the non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, but we're really not sure what the etiology is. The non-Hodgkin's lymphoma can be described as indolent, which means it's the slow-growing kind, or the aggressive kind, which means fast-growing kind. And I have out here on here a um, uh, a description of them and treatment and outcome. But overall, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, there's about a 60 to 80 percent remission um, in patients. Again, but that's remission, not really um, cure rate like we're going to see in Hodgkin's lymphoma. All right, so I thought this was interesting that they staged the different types of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And the early stage is that they find one lymph node area that's affected, either above or below the diaphragm muscle. And the diaphragm seems to be a, um, a anatomical divider for diagnosing the stages. Non-Hodgkin's lymphoma also, by the way, tend to develop in other areas and then take up residence in the lymph nodes and then migrate to other areas as well. So stage two, of course, will be now you have two different clusters of lymph nodes that are affected, either above or below. Then stage three, you now have clusters of lymph nodes on both sides of the diaphragm. And then stage four, we have lymphoma and lymph nodes um, above and below the diaphragm, but also has spread to other organs. It's infiltrated. Hodgkin's lymphoma, or Hodgkin's disease, is differentiated from other cancers by the type of cell involved. Um, this is uh, basically we're going to see this occurs in B cells. So this presence of the Reed Sternberg cell is really the diagnosis to determine if it's Hodgkin's lymphoma because in non-Hodgkin's lymphoma they don't have this Reed Sternberg cell. In Hodgkin's lymphoma, the cancer usually arises in a single node or chain of nodes. And like I said, its, it's um, presence um, is characterized by these Reed Sternberg cells. And they basically have twin nuclei and nucleoli that give them the appearance that they have owl eyes. So the owl eye cell is our diagnostic tool. Again, like I said, fever and chills that come and go typically in the late afternoon. I used to have a physiology student who had Hodgkin's lymphoma and he would literally go home in between lecture and lab and this is when I taught in the afternoon and evening. He would have to go home and take a shower and change his clothes because by the end of uh, the lecture he would just, his clothes would be saturated with sweat because he'd be breaking out in a fever loss of appetite, night sweats like I said, itching all over the body that can't be explained mostly at night, swelling of the lymph nodes but not not pain, um, weight loss like I said. Oh and here's something else. Um, this is oftentimes overlooked but one of the classic signs or I should say symptoms that a patient will report is that they experience back pain I mean really deep back pain after drinking alcohol. So there's pain in the lymph nodes from drinking the alcohol because some of the alcohol is absorbed into the lymph and irritates them. So my sister right now is undergoing several tests to rule out Hodgkin's lymphoma because just recently she on occasion has been having some glasses of wine and then experiencing really, really deep chest pain that she describes as going even as far as reaching her back. So we're hoping that those all come out negative, of course. Now leukocytosis and leukemia. Now leukemia means white blood. Now we're talking about cancer cells <coughs> in the blood. <coughs> Excuse me, this is not the solid tumor in limb that we see in lymphomas. So leukemia means, uh, it was first described as uh, from the physician who coined this phrase because he noticed that there was a reversal in the red blood cell to white blood cell ratio. In other words, the white blood cells were becoming far too numerous and the ratio was being disrupted. 
So leukocytosis is a general term to describe excessive numbers of white blood cells. Leukocytosis is normal when you are fighting an infection. You have increased white blood cells, but they are normal and functional. Leukocytosis also occurs with leukemia, except that with leukemia, the excessive white blood cells are not normal nor functional. Leukemia is a word to describe uncontrolled production of white blood cells caused by a cancerous mutation of a myelogenous or lymphogenous cell. What does that mean? Well, to remind you, our hemocytoblast gives birth to daughter cells that will be of one of two lineages. So the myelogenous will be your eosinophils, etc. Lymphogenous is going to be your T cells and B cells. So cancer-causing mutations in the myelogenous or lymphogenous cell lines cause leukemia, which is characterized by a greatly increased number of abnormal white blood cells in the blood. The first effect of leukemia is metastatic growth of leukemic cells in abnormal areas of the body. Leukemic cells from the bone marrow may reproduce so greatly that they invade the surrounding bone, causing pain and eventually a tendency for bones to fracture easily. In other words, the rate of production of these abnormal white blood cells becomes so great that the medullary cavity within the bone expands to accommod accommodate this rapidly dividing population of cells. Although there are greater numbers of white blood cells, they are not, they are not functional white blood cells. They are abnormal and released in a poorly differentiated state. Additionally, the cancer cells within the medullary cavity consume too many nutrients and this means that the development of other normal blood cells like platelets or red blood cells as well as the normal function of other parts of the body would be impeded. In other words, the cancer in the bone marrow leading to excessive amounts of immature white blood cells in the blood is consuming too many nutrients that the person is ingesting to the point where other parts of the body can um, suffer from lack of nutrients. And by this, almost all types of cancer cause both anorexia, which is a reduction in food intake caused primarily by diminished appetite, and cachexia. This is a metabolic disorder of increased energy expenditure leading to a weight loss greater than that caused by decreased food intake alone. In other words, again, the cancer cells are too metabolically active and consume too many nutrients. So what are some causes and classification of leukemias? Causes can be chromosomal changes, and we've discussed the Philadelphia chromosome. Uh, radiation, benzene. Now benzene is a uh, C6H6, so it's this nice six carbon ring that has, it's, it's got hydrogen, each carbon has two hydrogen each, and some of the carbons have double rings, and these double, uh, not, sorry, not double rings, double bonds, and these double bonds can basically migrate around the molecule. Benzene's found in a lot of stuff. Uh, benzene was used in the 50s to make Sanka coffee, you know, the decaffeinated coffee. So they use this chemical agent just to decaffeinate the coffee, which is horrific. So a high, high incidence of leukemia from benzene exposure. We use this as a, um, as a gasoline agent, you know, to remove the NOx and that sort of thing to improve the efficiency of the burning of our gasoline. And because of its link to um, its carcinogenic link, the state of California and the United States in general really, really limits its use or tries to. Um, certainly industry needs to use it, but they really try and limit how much a regular person can buy and use. So different classifications. There's lymphocytic and myelogenous from the two different uh, stem lines. And then there's acute or chronic for each of the ones. So with lymphocytic, acute lymphocytic leukemia, or ALL, or chronic lymphocytic leukemia, or CLL, we're talking about immature lymphocytes that infiltrate the spleen, lymph nodes, and even the central nervous system. With myelogenous leukemia, so we're talking about AML or CML, 
we are going to see immature granulocytes, immature eosinophils, basophils, etc., even erythrocytes and thrombocytes. And I got this picture from the Patient Education Reference Library, which says you can use this picture for nonprofit purposes, for the purposes of educating a patient. Well, you're not my patient, you're my students, but I'm educating you. So here, I thought I could use this picture, and at least I give it credit, right? So it shows you that benzene can be inhaled into the lungs. It gets absorbed into the blood, moves to the liver, where detox is attempted, but in the liver, the benzene is actually converted to phenol, and then the phenol can move to the bone marrow, and in the bone marrow, the phenol can either kill off stem cells, in which, play, in which case you can get aplastic anemia or hypoproliferative disorders, or you can get increased cells, as in the case of leukemia. So this is just a table from your textbook talking about clinical manifestations of leukemia. Um, obviously, there can be bone marrow depression if there's too much bone marrow making the lymphogenous cell lines. Uh, this could be a reduction in red blood cells then because this, the marrow is focusing on the white blood cell production. Of course, this can lead to anemia, and that means malaise and their fatigue. Um, it could lead to secondary infections uh, because, again, these white blood cells are not mature, so that can lead to the fever, of course. Or it could be because of the neoplastic cells with increased metabolism. Um, bleeding because of decreased thrombocytes. Headache because of leuke leukemic infiltration of the central nervous system, as I said. Um, and hyperuricemia, which is uric acid, uricemia, um, because the leukemia cells are proliferating too much, there's a high nu nucleotide metabolism. So uric acid is a byproduct of nucleotide metabolism. All right, so now our last slide. Uh, discusses plasma cell dyscrasias. Specifically, I'm going to focus on multiple myeloma. Now, this is a malignancy of B cells, mature, fully differentiated plasma cells. Um, what are some risk factors? We're really not sure what causes multiple myeloma, but we know it tends to affect um, people over 60. Um, Vietnam soldiers who fought in the conflict and were exposed to Agent Orange have a higher incidence. Viruses, again, very hard to figure out if they cause it or it's an opportunistic infection. Herbicides, pesticides, etc. Because the B cell is replicating and dividing, it makes an excessive amounts of IgG. And we can actually see this on our serum protein electrophoresis shown here in the bottom right of the picture where the IgG fraction is spiked higher than normal. It's almost to the level of albumin. And this is called the M protein spike. There's increased osteoclast activity. That means there's going to be more bone resorption. So the person is more at risk for pathologic fractures and bone pain. And because of the bone resorption, there can be hypercalcemia, which I'll remind you from Fizz, can literally cause the heart to stop. So it's an electrolyte imbalance. Um, the osteoclast activity is spurred on because there is more bone marrow activity to make more B cells that can then differentiate and turn into these malignant B cells. The prognosis is not very good. Typically with this multiple myeloma, it can lead to thrombocytopenia, anemia, neutropenia, and so of course the person is going to be at risk for secondary um, or opportunistic infections. All right, I'm just going to check my notes here to make sure that I am I think I've caught everything. It's time to move on next week into a very long, but I think interesting lecture on infectious diseases. At least I hope you find it interesting. Um, 
I'm going to ask you several questions, and I think at this point, don't hold me to it, instead of just giving you a traditional lecture where I'm going through different slides, I thought I would ask you questions that are the same questions on the study guide and put them on the slide and then give you the lecture to answer them. Um, but we'll see. I got I to gotta figure out if that's going to work or not. But until then, I hope you're enjoying Unit 2 so far. So far, <clears throat> I, like to, I like the postings that are, are occurring, but I hope to see many, many more. And I am halfway finished with grading your exams at this point, so I hope to have them posted by Sunday. Okay, take care.